Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Public Insights uh, Lecture. My name is Sally Shorthall. I work in the university and I co-chair the Public Insights uh, Lecture. I'm very pleased that tonight's lecture is given by one of my colleagues, Dr. Amy Proctor, and the title of her talk is Perspectives and Understandings of Good Farming. So shortly, Amy's going to uh, give the lecture. If you have uh, questions you would like to ask, please use the drop down function on your screen, or you can tweet us at Public Insights at um, at, at NCL. If you want to tweet about the event, please use hashtag uh, public insights NCL. Uh, I will be back after the lecture for a live Q and A with Amy. So I look forward to seeing you then, and I'm sure you'll all enjoy the lecture. As well as chairing this evening, I also have the privilege of in introducing Amy. So Amy Proctor, she grew up in Hull, she did her PhD there, and she had her first research position in the university there. So we lured her to come and join the Centre for Rural Economy at Newcastle University in 2008. And she came to work with my predecessor, Philip Lowe, who's also from, was from Hull, and our colleague Jeremy Philipson, who studied in Hull. So there's a real Hull theme going on here tonight. And, uh, Amy had thought about getting out her whole scarf. She came to work on a project called Science in the Field, and it was working with farm advisors and vet as knowledge brokers uh, with farmers. And this kind of thread continues in Amy's research. She's a geographer by training, and as a social scientist, her research interests center around understanding the knowledge and the expertise of people which underpins land and animal management. She is, and she has led many projects for DEFRA, Natural England, the EU and the ESRC. She's currently co-PI on a Welcome Trust funded project on endemic livestock disease, which is worth one and a half million pounds. Her expertise is sought on numerous national committees, including the steering committee of UKRI's Landscape Decisions Program, and she was invited by the um, government to be on a task force to look at land use futures as a result of the pandemic. So that's that's Amy's biography. But like I know she's a great colleague. She's smart. She's funny. It's fantastic to have her on the corridor. And, you know, she's she's a generous person and she exudes energy. So I'm sure this will come across in her lecture, which you will enjoy. And I look forward to seeing you afterwards for the live Q&A. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here. In this lecture, I'm going to draw upon various strands of research I've conducted over the last decade with colleagues here at Newcastle and at Hull University looking at farmers and farming systems. I'll consider what good means in the context of UK farms and farming today to groups at different ends of the supply chain. Specifically, I'll consider farmers' understandings and identities of the good farmer and compare this with non-farming perspectives, including those of advisors and consumers. And I'll attempt to tease out some of the similarities and differences in, the, in these con constructs of the good farmer. But why does this matter? Well, the last few months have made us more aware than ever of the precarious nature of our food system. Before supply chain issues, rising prices and driver shortages, we had hoarding and unprecedented demand for food banks due to COVID, alongside fears of Brexit shortages. But behind these headlines, the way our agricultural and food systems are governed is changing. Alongside the development of a new national food strategy, the United Kingdom's exit from the European Union in, in 2020 has paved the way for a comprehensive overhaul of agricultural policy. Held as the biggest transformation in generations, the future of UK farming has become keenly debated, from controversies around international trade deals and food standards, to proposals for a significant shift away from subsidies to a new system of support for the farming industry, where farmers are not just producing food, but also public goods, such as clean water, nature improvements, and flood risk management. 
Such proposed changes raise interesting questions about how our food is produced and by whom, and in particular, what it means to be a good farmer and good farming more broadly. Viewed within the context of um, debates around food democracy and consumers having more of an active part in how farming and food systems operate, there's a growing acknowledgement that we need to have a better understanding of the perspectives of food producers and consumers, including where they overlap and are distinctive in order to facilitate better connections between them. Exploring what different groups mean by good in the context of farmers and farming enables to us to start to unpack some of this, providing an entry point into bigger debates around what we eat, how it's produced and the role of farming in the future. So I wanted to start by saying that debates around what is a good farmer are not new. Thanks to my colleague Sue Bradley for this excerpt from AG Street, who was a farmer, writer and broadcaster who published over 20 books on farming life from the 1930s onwards. In his book Landmarks, published in 1949, he reflects on this very issue. What, or rather who, is a great farmer? He must be a good farmer in that his methods enhance fertility, thus enabling him to leave his land at the end of his career in better condition than he found it. He must also be a successful farmer, making his farming pay a good profit. But to warrant the title great, he must also be something else, a farmer who bestows a lasting benefit to the agriculture of his country. The description concerns an arable farmer, but here we can pick up on notions of a good farmer in terms of the production roles and their wider social and moral roles. So a good farmer is dynamic, constantly improving over time and space, whose business is profitable and ultimately leaving a positive legacy on the land and to the wider industry. Through this presentation, I'm going to explore how many of Street's ideas still prevail to this day. It's fair to say that academics and in particular social scientists have spent a lot of time reflecting on how the identity of the good farmer manifests in farming practices and behaviours, and there's a growing body of research on this. Similarly, policymakers have long been concerned with typologies attempting to categorise farmers in order to understand good behaviour and target policies and engagement to influence bad practices or behaviour. Much existing research has explored farmers' own understandings of the good farmer, principally in relation to arable farming and ideas around land and environmental stewardship. This is primarily focused on a within-group understanding of the good farmer identity. Exploring how farmers' understandings and perspectives of good compare to other groups, such as advisors and consumers, allows us to, under, um, to extend this existing work and take in multiple perspectives. So my focus in this presentation is on the social construct of the good farmer. That is, um, that is, I'm not trying to objectively measure what a good farmer is or come up with a single definition of a good farmer. Rather, I'm going to explore different groups' views on this. So starting with farmer constructs of the good farmer, there are, of course, many different dimensions to this. Farmers face increasing pressures to deliver a range of goods and services involving complex requirements. Commercial objectives to produce quality primary products competitively have to mesh with broader societal demands of food security, sustainable resource use, the management of animal and plant health and adaptation to environmental change. I've often heard it say that um, farmers have multiple roles. They have to be soil scientists, stone wallers, um, mechanics, vets, agronomists, accountants, marketeers, the list goes on. But what does it mean to be a good farmer? In some recent research with 30 beef, sheep and dairy farmers from across the northeast, Yorkshire and the northwest, we asked what makes a good farmer. While many farmers acknowledged the challenge of defining a good farmer, the responses were wide ranging. The key characteristics to emerge from the data are summarised on this slide. These are listed in no particular order, but include on the left aspects linked to their production roles, um, such as cares for livestock, looks after the environment and makes a profit. And on the right, more personal qualities of the farmer. So being knowledgeable and up to date, having a dedication or passion for the job, being innovative and so on. Of course, many of these things are intertwined. For example, adhering to industry standards is, is linked to livestock care and the environment through accreditation and stewardship schemes. Similarly, um, maintaining traditions and being innovative are not as diametrically opposed as one might first assume, and I'll, and I'll talk more about this later.
We can look in more detail at what the farmers we spoke to understood as a good farmer. It was clear that this related to two aspects in particular, the qualities of the farmer and the key outcomes and outputs of the farm. If we consider the key qualities first, the top quote here picks up on many of these, um, which included being flexible, efficient, effective, adaptable, and continually learning, having empathy towards livestock, being devoted, passionate, and committed, and being forward thinking, progressive, and identifying opportunities. However, the main focus is on the key outcomes and outputs of the farm. Farmers refer to the quality of livestock, crops, and the wider environment as key indicators of a good farmer. And most strikingly, profit was a recurring theme, as indicated by the bottom three quotes here. Um, and indeed, one interviewee noted, you can only tell a good farmer by looking at their books. So what becomes clear is that farmers are undoubtedly balancing many different demands, but unsurprisingly, at their core is their primary function as business people. They are driven by the need to make a profit, and this is viewed as central to being a good farmer. How do farmers understand and perform the identity of the good farmer? I'm going to explore how this is played out in relation to three of the characteristics identified by the farmers we interviewed. Firstly, in terms of farmers' relationships with animals and around caring for livestock, health and welfare. Secondly, focusing on farmers' roles in caring for the land and the environment. And then thirdly, in relation to a good farmer as one that is continually learning. So I'll start with the relationship with animals and notions of care as one dimension of the good farmer identity. In interview, when asked about what a good farmer was, different perspectives were evident on what the good farmer is expected to know and do in relation to farmed animal health and welfare. Farmers raised the topic of care in relation to empathy with animals and in relation to economics of farming. We can see here that these are on a spectrum. As this first quote illustrates, for some farmers, empathy was central to notions of animal care. Others associated care with good business sense, as the third quote here indicates. However, we found most farmers mix these perspectives, as illustrated by this middle quote. So the farmer here says, it's somebody who has empathy, it's care. You've got to care about your animals. If you don't have the empathy with your animals, then there's no point. They're a commodity, let's not be about the bush, it's a business. They're there to make you a profit. And I think farmers should stop being shy of talking about that. But you've got to have empathy because they are living, breathing creatures. This highlights the multiple motivations and challenges of being a good livestock farmer and the need for many different qualities from empathy and husbandry to business acumen. Next, I consider a second dimension of the good farmer, which is the relationship to the land and the environment. Much has been written about changes to farmers' roles in environmental management, principally through various publicly funded schemes such as countryside stewardship. And indeed, much academic work on the good farmer has focused on this. Here I draw on some recent research we conducted with a group of 19 farmers and land managers in Northumberland National Park as part of a project designed to inform the development of the environmental land management scheme, part of a new system of administering subsidies to farmers in England, which centres on a novel approach of paying farmers to deliver public goods like clean air and water. As this first quote indicates, the group saw a good farmer as one who cares for the environment. All were involved in existing agri-environment agreements on their land, which was commonly protected by special designations such as triple SIs and special areas of conservation. It was clear that they had a very strong understanding of their land, their soils, the water, biodiversity, and its potential to deliver public goods. Many of the farmers were aware of a perceived tension between agriculture and the environment, but as the next two quotes here illustrate, felt these shouldn't be in conflict. For many, environmental enhancement is seen as going hand in hand with their primary function as food producers, and as something which needs to be balanced with returning a profit. In the group I worked with, there was a desire to ensure upland communities and livelihoods um, remain viable in any future scheme, where delivery of public goods contributes to environmental enhancement, but also profitability. So as we found with care of animals, the construction of the good farmer identity is based on balancing care for the environment with maintaining a profitable farm business. With many of the farmers we speak to referring to a good farmer 
as one who farms both profitably and sustainably. The third aspect that I wanted to touch on was the notion of a good farmer as one who is knowledgeable and up to date and continuously learning. Again, this is something I've explored with farmers across a range of projects. When we ask farmers about their specific knowledge sources, a complicated picture emerges of externally and locally sourced knowledge. As the diagram here shows, farmers are continually looking to a range of sources to maintain and develop their knowledge and expertise. They refer to scientific, professional and technical and regulatory sources. So information obtained from research and contacts at universities and colleges, from the NFU and breed societies, and from levy boards and um, accreditation schemes. Increasingly, they also reference the role of the internet, the media and social media. So farmers are drawing from a range of sources in order to, um, to keep on top of developments across the industry, including new ideas, approaches and products. All of these are seen as valuable in extending knowledge, but what we've also found is that farmers are also exchanging knowledge that they themselves generate, generate locally, in their words, on the job or in the field. This includes experiential knowledge derived from observation and application and refined through adaptation and replication and experimental knowledge from co conducting their own interventions as part of problem solving. So trying things out and comparing different approaches, as this first quote here suggests. And um, he's got to be a learner. If you look around the guys that are good farmers, they have all got something different on the go, a little project. And sometimes that has been spread around the area or the country in some cases. This field generated knowledge is not entirely self generated, however, it also comes from working with and learning from co workers, peers, and advisors. As the last two quotes here illustrate, the generation and diffusion of knowledge and techniques is critically built around complex networks of knowledge exchange. It is these interactions and exchanges between different farmers and between farmers and their advisors which enhance what we call their vernacular expertise. That is the knowledge and expertise that they have and develop in their locality, but which is crucially nourished by an array of outside sources and agents. It's clear from our interviews that farmers see a good farmer as one who is sourcing, generating and exchanging knowledge and thus continually learning. So we've considered some of the different ways farmers understand the identity of the good farmer, the key qualities and outcomes they associate with it. And I've talked about three different ways this is performed. But as I noted in my introduction, it's interesting to extend this analysis by comparing and contrasting um, farmer perspectives with others, starting with the advisor view. Advisors are those that work to support farmers and land managers. The advisory professions include vets, land agents, ecologists, agronomists, planning, building and livestock consultants. So a whole array of practitioners who play a role in advising and supporting farmers, operational and strategic, and strategic decision making and enhancing the skills of farming and land based businesses. In some recent research, we interviewed 20 vets, animal health specialists and hoof trimmers about their experiences of working with livestock farmers. When we asked them their view on what makes a good farmer, unsurprisingly, given the animal focus of these professionals, animal care crops up. So adv advisors emphasise compassion and care for animals. And as this first quote indicates, they see a good farmer as one constantly striving to improve welfare. But they also refer to the importance of this going hand in hand with good economic performance, mirroring the views of the farmers I described earlier. So as you can see from the second quote, I think you really have to break that down into good economic performance, a profitable farmer, purely in terms of high health and welfare, their livestock and so on. These advisors also pick out some key qualities which extend ideas around what it is to be a good farmer. So the last two quotes here on the slide provide a sense of these qualities, which included being motivated and having purpose, being a good decision maker, being inquisitive, ready to learn and open to new ideas, and also being collaborative and a good team player. In interview, these advisors identify different groups of farmers, including those they consider progressive and good, who follow their advice and are willing to take on new ideas, and those who are more reluctant or hesitant to take on new ideas or adopt new practices. 
Here we've visually represented the key themes coming out of our farmer and advisor interviews to see the similarities between these two groups. So caring for livestock, being forward looking and making a profit are considered central to a good farmer for both groups. It's also interesting, however, to note some of the differences too. Advisors emphasise the personal qualities of the good farmer and in particular the importance of team working. Although farmers mention personal qualities too, their, their main focus is the outputs or outcomes of the good farmer's farm. This is interesting and, and perhaps to some extent reveals something about how farmers judge each other's worth and demonstrate this to others. Interestingly, farmers also saw a good farmer as one who promotes a positive, positive image of farming uh, to the public. So what about the general public? What does good farming mean to those at the other end of the supply chain? And what do consumers think a good farmer looks like? In an online survey, we asked over 500 members of the public what makes a good farmer. Specifically, we asked them to rate their agreement to nine characteristics drawn from themes emerging interviews with them, farmers and advisors. Overall, the public agreed or strongly agreed with all the statements. However, when, when ranked, cares for livestock, adheres to industry standards and being knowledgeable had the highest percentage agreement. Interestingly, being innovative and making a profit had a much lower agreement rating amongst consumers. In this slide, we can begin to compare perspectives from the three different groups. We can start to see where there are subtle differences in understanding with farmers emphasising the outputs and outcomes of the good farmer's farm, advise, advisors focusing on the personal qualities of the good farmer, and in particular the importance of working collaboratively, and consumers um, emphasising adherence to um, industry standards. But we can also begin to see where understandings are overlapping. So care for animals matters to all groups, being innovative and forward-looking, the key qualities also identified by all groups, although this wasn't the most valued attribute by consumers. Most interesting, however, is the different perspectives on profit. We have two groups in farmers and advisors who have a shared understanding of good farming around the importance of the farm needing to make money to be sustainable. And another group, consumers, who are much less focused on the need for a farm to make a profit. Before I conclude, I thought it might be interesting to consider one final aspect of our research where we asked both farmers and advisors what makes a bad farmer. While the, whilst the focus of this presentation has been on the good farmer, it's important that we take care not to privilege the experience and expertise of farmers or view this through rose tinted glasses. Exploring notions of a bad farmer provides critical balance to our analysis. So what is falling out here? We found some farmers hesitant about discussing the idea of a bad farmer, and indeed some noted a distinction between consistently poorly performing farmers and those who may have experienced personal challenges or been hijacked by the vagaries of seasons, weather and markets, for example. But when pressed, a couple of themes emerged. For many, the quality of the outputs of the farm were mentioned, and in particular, livestock health and welfare were considered a key barometer. As these first two quotes indicate, judgments about a bad farmer were based on the appearance of animals and what, re what this reveals about their care. So you have a farmer here saying, there's a few lame ducks out there, you judge them by their animals. And another saying, you can tell the guys that have a pride in it and you can see the stock at the auction marts, you know the guys who are looking after the stock properly and the guys that are maybe not looking after the stock properly. Vets also emphasize poor welfare as a key determinant of a bad farmer, as this third quote highlights. Indeed, another vet noted that there aren't many knowingly cruel farmers, but that where health and welfare practices are poor, this was one objective measure of a bad farmer. Secondly, farm appearance was often referenced as a key signifier of a bad farmer. These three quotes here from farmers give a sense of this. The third farmer here featured actually gave a pretty extensive list um, of what makes a bad farmer. So he also mentioned someone who's constant, um, constantly recruiting, um, who has issues with product quality or hygiene, who may fail a farm audit, and notes that there are actually more ways of determining a poor farmer than a good one. There was, however, an acknowledgement that these visual indicators of a bad farmer may not present a full picture. 
with a couple of farmers noting that making a judgment about a farmer based on appearances of the farm alone can be misleading. So examples were given where animals or crops may look healthy, but this might be to the detriment of the environment. Others talked about some of the messiest farms actually being the most profitable because farmers don't make money from keeping things tidy and clean. Similarly, in this final quote here from a vet, we again see how a farm's appearance isn't everything. So the vet says, I'm not bothered if it's a farm that is six inches in mud, as long as their animals are kept well and looked after well. That's what it's all about for me. I can go to some farms that have got concrete everywhere and big, wonderful sheds. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're looking after the cows to the best of their ability. Some academics have questioned the relevance of these visual symbols to farming today, arguing that a farmer can't be seen from a distance, um, but needs to be studied close up as more of production is concealed in intensive barns and the notion of a tidy farm comes up against environmental practices which encourage the appearance of weedy or untended fields. What is perhaps interesting here is that appearances are seemingly important to the public, however. When we asked the public in our consumer survey what they thought a good farm might look like, from 101 responses, a fifth mentioned cleanliness and notions of a clean and tidy farm environment. This same survey also highlighted that the public have an idealised mental image of farms and farming, and that this may be at odds with the realities of many farms and farming practices. So how does this all come together? There's been much reflection on farming futures in policy, in practice and in the press of late, so it feels timely to consider critically the notion of the good farmer. We saw that farms themselves carry multiple identities in the way they perform and understand what it means to be good. There was an acknowledgement that farmer perspectives on the good farmer are highly contextual and were likely to differ depending on geographical location or the character or outlook of a farmer. So for example, those who consider themselves to be first and foremost a stocks person or say a, bus a business person. But we also see that the good farmer is a dynamic concept our research shows that farmers, advisors and consumers have sometimes overlapping and sometimes different ideas about the good farmer. And this is likely to keep evolving over time and space. Indeed, on this issue of changing perspectives, some of the, the farmers we spoke to noted that ideas and understandings of a good farmer are likely to differ across different generations. And one farmer even noted how his own ideas had evolved over time too. So he said, when you're a 12 year old, you think a good farmer is the guy with the brand new tractor. When you're 18, you may think the farmer with a good farm is winning the shows and the pedigree things or whatever. I just think it's a lot of things now. I'm 49 and most of all, if I'm in a hill, I think, have they got waders and hill beds flying over? And then I think, are their stone walls in good order? I'm less interested in their machinery. The concept of the good farmer is therefore multi-layered, encompassing elements of continuity and change, past and future, tradition and progression. I've seen these nuances in my own research. So I've spoken to farmers who consider themselves as progressive and innovative, but are also desperately keen to maintain or preserve rural traditions and livelihoods too. I've included here a final quote from a farmer from our ongoing research, which in many ways echoes the ideas that A.G. Street articulated all the way back in the 1940s. So the farmer says, a good farmer is someone who, with the assets in his control, soil, money, machinery, livestock, makes the margin whilst maintaining, cherishing, preserving for as long as possible or reducing the depreciation on all of those and hopefully appreciating some of them for the next generation. So he makes a profit. The welfare is good. His soil husbandry is good. And on the back of that, the environment will be good. And there's something to pass on to the next generation. That is a good farmer. This quote, I think, highlights how continuity and legacy remain integral to the good farmer identity. So to conclude, converging environmental, health, welfare and political agendas make the future of food and farming one of today's most contested issues. Media representations are often, and often unhelpfully polarised. Criticisms rest frequently on simplistic understandings coloured by false memories of an earlier golden age, whilst defensive farmers can struggle to articulate the challenges they face. Through this presentation, I've used the notion of the good farmer as a lens to explore new and different perspectives on farming and farmers, drawing on the alternative insights of advisors and consumers.
but why is this important? We know from our interviews that many of the farmers and vets we talk to are acutely aware of the importance of perceptions of farming and keenly aware of increasing public pressures around veganism and climate change, describing the criticism faced through social media platforms in particular. We also know that while some consumers are becoming increasingly, increasingly interested in and more aware of how their food is being produced, driven by moral and ethical concerns, many people are quite removed from farming and don't know where their food comes from or how farming is done. Our research highlights where perspectives on the good farmer are, diver are diverging, such as around profit, where ideas of what makes a good farmer differ within and between groups, so for example, in relation to visual appearance, but also where there are shared understandings, such as around the importance of care for animals. These insights provide opportunities to potentially bridge perspectives and encourage conversations and interactions between, tho between those who are and aren't involved in the farming industry. Having these conversations and understanding these multiple perspectives matter if we are to encourage a, divi a, di a diverse range of voices to contribute to thinking around the future of our food and farming systems so they can deliver what different groups might want from them and achieve broader societal aims. Thank you for listening and I look forward to your comments and questions. Amy, thank you for a fantastic lecture. It was uh, just fantastic and, and really nicely delivered. I could hug the whole question time myself. <laughs> but I, I do have one question I want to ask you, and that is, you know, it, you gave such a fantastic representation of what historically and, and what a contemporary good farmer looks like. What does the good farmer of the future look like and will will the, will farmers be relevant in the future? Ah, that, <laughs> that's a really interesting question, Sally. Um, I suppose there's lots of talk at the moment about um, the contribution of farming to global emissions and, and climate change. There's you know lots of talk around rewilding and synthetic agriculture. So um, I guess in the eyes of some stakeholders, farmers do may feel redundant, I guess, but I, I suppose in the short to medium term, my answer would be, I think farmers will still play a central role. I think given the, the debates that we've had in, in recent years about sustainable food systems and self-sufficiency and, and resilience and, and, and the importance of local food supply chains, I think farmers will remain relevant. Um, and I, I guess that's where the, the notion of the good farmer is interesting. Um, will it will it be only the good farmers that remain in the industry? I suppose, and um, and there's still quite a lot of uncertainty around that, so it's it's hard to tell. But I guess the key issue will be how farmers adapt and respond to the change in subsidy regimes and and the, the net zero targets that have been set. Um, I mean, the NFU itself has quite ambitious targets for for net zero to to get there for agriculture by 2040. So I guess will a uh, Will a farmer in the future be a, a net zero or a, a carbon neutral farmer, perhaps? I, I, think, I think the key thing, I suppose, is that a lot of the characteristics that I talked about in the presentation are likely to endure. So a lot of the things that I talked about a good farmer being will always be, you know, significant and important. But I suppose if we're thinking about what a future farmer might be, a, a sort of innovative or sustainable farmer will be one who's likely to understand I guess a range of approaches and, and, and technologies which enable them to, to balance food production with um, efforts to decrease emissions and, and enhance carbon sinks and so on. And on top of delivering all these public goods that they're, they're, they're gonna be expected to deliver on as well. Mm. Yeah, great, thank you. We have another question here from Nick, uh, who wants to know, is there a difference between what arable farmers think of as a good farmer compared to livestock farmers? 
or between older and younger farmers or between owner occupiers and tenants. So I guess he's getting into all the, the different categories. Yeah, really, really great question. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think um, this is really interesting for me because we're, we're still very much at the early stages of our analysis of the data. So we the 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 farmers that we served at, surveyed uh livestock farmers so we don't have that kind of arable comparator but um we um we could certainly mine the data to to see whether there are any nuances in in where what the perspectives and understandings of good farmer were um with regard to age and um between owner occupiers and tenants it's not something we've done yet but it's certainly something that we could do but i guess there are lots of different sort of reflecting on on the presentation I think there are lots of things that I was thinking about as it was playing about where there may be nuances and differences between um say um sort of traditional farmers and perhaps new entrants into the profession or um where there might be differences in understanding of the good farmer by gender that's something so that you're probably much more kind of um, accomplished at being able to answer but yeah I think certainly watch this space there's a certain scope for us to be able to to look at that in more detail but we haven't done it yet. Yeah I was struck by that kind of almost there was a subliminal message coming through from the way people talked about farming that farmers are men but that's a conversation for another um, date. <laughs> uh, there's a, a really interesting question here from Jane who asks and yeah, we could talk, I think, for a long time about this. She asks, isn't good farming always more expensive? Yeah, it's that's a really interesting question, Jane. And I think it's something that with a lot of the farmers that we talked about, it's very much kind of um, at the forefront of their minds, particularly the, the group that I referred to um, that were we worked with in the, the Northumberland National Park. You know, they really, um, you know, they, they felt that they were producing really high quality, high welfare um, animals, um, you know, for the market. And I think, you know, alongside that, you know, they recognize that there is a, a potentially a higher cost to that. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think there is that acknowledgement. I think that allied with that, there's a, you know, there is issues around, you know, um, what that then means for, affordability of food and and who that might exclude within the market and so on it's a it is a real challenge a real dilemma I think and it's at the forefront of a lot of debates about um about these kinds of things at the moment it's interesting because I for the, the work you know I've been doing for DEFRA Amy I interviewed a farm business consultant who actually thought farming in harmony with me with nature and doing good farming reducing numbers of livestock, having more pasture um, fed livestock actually can increase profit. And women I interviewed who had changed from that very intensive production to more native breeds and lowered the livestock had actually seen an increase in their profit. So I think it's a really interesting question. Yeah. And I think it will depend on scale and so on. And actually the question from Willow Trail Farm follows on nicely from Jane's and uh, they ask, they're curious about consumers not being worried about profit, but do they want cheap food? And if both, if they're not worried about farmers having a profit and if they want cheap food, how do they rationalize the two? And that, yeah. that's the real dilemma, isn't it? It is, it's really interesting. I mean, that was one of the things that was most striking that came out of the, the consumer survey that we, that we ran, you know, that um, I suppose, you know, profit had a lower agreement rating in the survey, but, and, and, and I guess it's possibly because for consumers, it's it's less tangible or less visible to them. But then, you know, um, I suppose the irony is that if a farmer isn't profitable, they're unlikely to be delivering on a lot of the things that the public do want to see. So, you know, healthy livestock and a good environment and so on. So. I guess it's it, it is interesting, and and when we ran um, we ran a, a public engagement exercise in the Granger Market in Newcastle the other year, um, where we asked members of the public to um, to play a game where they they had to um, step into the shoes of a farmer and make decisions about what to do with a sick cow, and and they had to run through a sequence of steps and make choices about whether or not to to seek a vet and whether to get the herd checked and and so on, with sort of cost implications at each stage and. 
And afterwards, many of the participants that um, were involved um, said how challenging they thought the exercise was because um, they sort of began to acknowledge how difficult a lot of the decisions farmers make and, and sort of putting themselves in their shoes made them understand the economics of farming. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, made them realise, you know, that profit is sort of key to being able to do a lot of other things, you know, on the farm. But, um, yeah. So, yes. so Ambrose has a techie question for you. How representative was the group used in the survey compared to the national picture of farmers in terms of climate awareness, engagement and so on? Oh, good question. Um, I mean, it was it was never intended to be um, a representative sample. The, the farmers that we um, that we interviewed like I said before they were all livestock farmers um, because the focus of the research was around animal welfare and disease so um, so yeah so um, hard to know um, because it was qualitative work driving it so it was it was more about getting their understandings and responses to um, to, to disease and welfare and health issues so we weren't looking for a representative sample is the kind of the short answer to that. And Simon wants to know, have subsidies impacted on whether good farmers are able to do good? I mean, it's an interesting question because there has been that debate that subsidies in a way have almost prevented farmers thinking about the, the business, the profit side, where it's their revenue streams. I don't know if you can comment on that, Amy. Yeah, a little bit. I think, yeah, the, the work that we did with the the um, the Northumberland National Park farmers, I think, you know, we were working through a lot of these issues about where, you know, where um, the current subsidy regime sort of starts to taper off. What opportunities will there be for, you know, farmers to, you know, to, to make money from delivering public goods? And, um, you know, I think there is a real acknowledgement that that will, you know, some will really relish those opportunities if they aren't already doing, you know, doing a lot of that work already. Um, you know, I think inevitably there will be a lot of farmers that maybe, you know, drop out of the system because, you know, they they don't see those opportunities there or don't want to get, you know, don't want to sort of be involved in that side of it anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, I think there is a pressure there that, you know, farmers will have to, um, you know, if they want to top up incomes um, through, you know, those to unlock those um, subsidies, they're going to have to to do that, you know, deliver on those public goods. But there's still mm -hmm. a huge amount of uncertainty around what what they might look like, how the what the payments might be around that. So, yes, yeah, still lots of questions and answered around that, I think. OK, great. And the final question of the evening comes from Neve. And Neve asks, do you think the good in the good farmer is the best way of framing this concept or does it risk over romanticizing farming? Would it be better to talk about the skillful farmer, the effective farmer? So I'm sure this is something you've thought about. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Neve. That's a great question. I, I mean, it is. I, I think, you know, we've had discussions within our research team about this, about, um, you know, whether, you know, is good relevant anymore? Should we be talking about, you know, a sustainable farmer, an innovative farmer, you know, a, this, this, you know, a caring farmer? There's all sorts of ways, I guess, that you could frame frame the analysis. Um, it's hard, really. I, I guess, you know, it's it's an in as for the purposes of our research, it's a really interesting way of um, provoking a response. So good is a good way of kind of getting people into a conversation. Um, it's interesting because it does, you know, people always have a view on it. Um, so it might not necessarily reflect what farmers, you know, maybe are or should be, but it's, it's, a, good, it's a good way as a social scientist to get into a conversation, I think. <laughs> So, Dr. Amy Proctor, thank you so much for giving us tonight's uh, Public Insights Lecture, which was fascinating. So, thank you. If it was live, you would hear the resounding applause and we would be now be taking you out for a nice dinner. Thanks, so, Sally. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much. And thank you to you, our audience, for uh, coming along and your participation and your questions. 
Uh, we always like to see you when we can. Our next event is this Thursday, the 2nd of December, and it's by Neil Carmichael, and it's titled New Conservatives, the Conservative Party after Brexit. So we hope some of you will be able to join us then. And good night from us and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday evening.